Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to ICANX, Connecting the World and the Universe. My name is Professor Martin Thu, coming from the Eastern United States, from North Carolina State University. This month, we have had a series of talks, uh, two of which have been on liquid metals, and today we will be concluding our month with my, Professor Michael Dickey, who is my colleague here at North Carolina State University. In the panels today, I will be uh, joined by uh, Xiang Tang, Wei Rao, Xing Yu Jiang, and Minsik Kong. Our speaker, uh, Professor Michael Dickey, uh, uh, did his undergraduate at Georgia Tech, followed by a PhD at, in Texas. And then after that, he went to Harvard and worked with uh, George Weisheitz. And he left the George Weisheitz group right before I joined myself but we go to connect uh, later on because we work on the same field. Michael has published uh, have published extensive amount of work on soft matter. He works on controlling properties of liquid metals, uh, polymers, and a combination of uh, those materials. He has been, uh, he's done uh, sabbaticals at Microsoft and EPFL, and is a, a one of our distinguished uh, professors here at NC State. And with that, Michael, I don't want to take a lot of your time. You have a list of awards. I'm not going to go through all of them. So I'll let your work shine, Michael. Thank you, Martin. Share my screen. Does everything look good? Yep. All right, great. Well, thank you so much for the introduction, Martin, and thank you for the invitation to be here. I'm really honored and excited to talk with you all today about our work at NC State on liquid metals. My primary goal today is just to get you excited about liquid metals, explain why they're interesting. Um, so my talk is sort of high level. I'm going to touch on a bunch of different things to show you the interesting properties of these materials. But before I get into the technical part, I recognize that today is part of the, uh, the Moon Festival in China. So I wanted to celebrate all of my friends and uh, former students and visitors that I've been very lucky to work with um, that are from China. So these are just some pictures. I probably don't have everybody in here, um, but uh, but anyway, I feel very lucky to work have worked with so many uh, great people, including one of the panelists today that you'll you'll hear from in just a little bit. So I'm at NC State along with Martin, and we are located in the state of North Carolina, which is on the east coast of the United States. We're actually in Raleigh, which is the capital of North Carolina. It's right here in the middle. Um, it's a beautiful state. We've got beaches on the east. We've got mountains on the west. And for a number of reasons, Raleigh is always considered one of the best places to live in the entire United States. Uh, we're very lucky to have good facilities. This is our uh, brand new student center. This is our engineering library. And this is our football stadium, which is where hopefully I will be tonight. I sit somewhere like right there. Um, one, this is a really exciting time to be in Raleigh. This is one of the, the major tech hubs in the United States. And to just sort of allude to that, Apple, the, the company Apple announced a couple of years ago that they're going to build their East Coast um, campus here in Raleigh. So they've started building and it's going to be a, a big campus with lots of people. And uh, so this is really good for NC State because we're the big tech university uh, in the state of North Carolina. In our group, we work on a number of different things, um, sort of united by these words, as, as Martin alluded to. So interfaces, patterning, soft materials. And we don't just work on liquid metal. So I thought I'd just spend one slide showing you some examples, actually some, some work that's been done by um, some Chinese students. So on the left, this is a, a little video of um, some plastic, basically polystyrene, that we've patterned in 2D with black ink. And when we shine light on this material, we can get it to fold into a 3D shape. And so this is interesting because it's a way to convert two-dimensional patterns into three-dimensional shapes in a very simple way. So there's a lot of two-dimensional patterning techniques, whether it be inkjet printing or lithography, that sort of thing. And then on the right is uh, an example from recent, more recent example from our group of making tough materials. So today I'm gonna to be telling you about stretchable devices and you need to be able to encapsulate them with, with tough materials. So here we've been working with gels and this is a, a very thin piece of hydrogel. And if you've worn contact lenses, you know that hydrogels are very weak and brittle. So we just dropped a ball, it tears right through it. 
Um, but uh, Mei Zhang, who worked on this, figured out how to make these materials very tough by using what's called ionic liquids. So I'm not going to talk about these, but it's just to show that we work on things other than liquid metals. But really, the, the thing that our group is most known for is our work on liquid metals, and that's what I'm going to focus on today. Now, when you hear the term liquid metal, this might mean different things to different people. Um, if you, a lot of people, when they hear liquid metal, think of mercury, but that's toxic. There's also elements over here on the left-hand side of the periodic table that are dangerous. They're reactive, uh, radioactive, and so we, we don't want to use those. So it's really process of elimination that leads us to gallium. But I'd like to point out that there's a really nice talk that was about a week ago by Karash, my friend who's pictured here, um, in which he gives a more broader definition of liquid metals. He says, well, liquid metals can be anything up to about 300 degrees Celsius because that's something we can do in a lab very easily. Um, and if you'd like to learn more about that, uh, this is a really nice review article by my friend Torben, who's also pictured here. Anyway, um, we're going to focus just on room temperature liquid metals in this talk, and basically it's, it's gallium. And you'll notice that gallium is right below aluminum in the periodic table, and that's going to be important in just a second. So I'm going to start by telling you just some very basic properties of, of these materials. Um, and I'm going to use this type of slide, gallium alloys with amazing properties. This is going to be kind of a, a thing I'm going to keep coming back to. So the first property that's very important is that it has a low melting point. It melts, gallium melts at about 30 degrees Celsius. And if you add other metals, it can depress the, the, the melting point further. So this is a picture of gallium in somebody's hand. And you can see that it's solid here, but it's melting when it's touching the body. So of course, you might argue this is the most important property because if it wasn't a liquid, um, we couldn't do most of the things that we do. In addition, it has very low vapor pressure. Basically, it's zero. And that's important because, you know, if you have take water and water has a vapor pressure, it can evaporate. But with a liquid metal, um, even if you heat it, it doesn't evaporate. Of course, at some point it will, but at room temperature, it, it does not. So that's good because you you're not going to breathe it or have it disappear over time. And then, you know, usually people worry about toxicity. Uh, for example, mercury is toxic. Um, but uh, the toxic toxicity of this material is considered to be very low. And in fact, this is a review article that talks about therapeutic activity for gallium. So gallium has actually been evaluated for, uh, for different medical applications. I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, I would just say, uh, since this is recorded, I would just say that you should be careful with gallium because it's not a nutrient that's found in our bodies. But nevertheless, there's there's no evidence to suggest that it's uh, it's dangerous. So anyway, be careful, uh, but don't be scared. For us, one of the most important properties is that it's a liquid and it's got a low viscosity. So this video shows a syringe with this gallium indium. So here we've added indium to lower the melting point. And you can see it's very easy to just inject or uh, dispense it from a, a, a syringe. So it's very similar to water in that way. And that enables us to do some interesting things that would not be possible with copper or aluminum, for example. So we just recently published this, uh, this review on ways to pattern the liquid metal. And it's a bit of a busy figure, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk you through it. And I'm going to start here at the top with this technique we call constraining. It's basically putting the liquid inside of a, a container. And, uh, and we can do this because it's a liquid. So here we, we have a microchannel. You can see right here, and there's an inlet hole and an outlet hole. And we inject the metal. And you'll see that it will flow through here, come out the other side. And then we're going to do it again. There's an inlet hole. It will flow through and end up over here. We break the oxide in this case just with our thumb by applying a little bit of pressure. And, uh, and once it's in there, it holds its shape because, um, as I'll explain in a second, it forms an oxide that sort of causes it to stick to the, the, the silicone here. So we've used this to make different things like very soft and very stretchy antennas, which are shown here, uh, as well as electrodes and microfluidic channels. Uh, but it turns out it's actually even easier to do this um, than just simple injection. So in this video, there's an inlet hole and an outlet hole. You can actually not, you don't actually need the outlet hole if you use the following technique. So this was... Um, uh, kind of a really simple way to pattern the metal. And in this case, we're taking the liquid metal and we're putting it over top of the inlet hole. And there's no outlet. You can see the microchannels here. They're kind of faintly visible. 
And this whole thing is placed inside of a vacuum container, which pulls the air out of the silicone, which is this clear material. And as you'll see, um, Yilian, who's pictured here, you can see his reflection. He's going to come up, a former student in our group. Um, he's going to turn the valve and let the air back in the chamber. So now atmospheric pressure is pushing here, and that will push the metal into these microchannels in a very simple way. So again, the channels are under vacuum because we've, we've pulled vacuum, pulled all the air out. And so there's a difference in pressure between here and here, and that pushes the metal in. So anyway, very simple way to, to pattern the metal. And this is only possible because it's a liquid at room temperature. This has allowed us to do some very interesting things. So for example, this is a collaboration with my friend um, Tao, who's pictured here. And uh, the idea is that with historically with materials, there's this general trade-off. If you have a, a piece like some, something like a piece of rubber that's very stretchable, so it's very high on this axis, it also tends to be very permeable. And the reason it's permeable is because the, uh, the, the polymer molecules can move around very easily, which means gas can go through it very easily. So if you wanna have a good barrier, typically you wanna use a metal. And if you don't believe me, look inside of a potato chip bag. You'll see in a potato chip bag, there's a lining of aluminum that protects the chips from going stale, going bad. So you might've guessed how we solve this problem. We use liquid metals and combine them with rubber to create something that's very stretchable. So we're up here, but also very low permeability. Why would you want to do that? Well, one possible application is making a stretchable battery. So normally batteries are rigid because they need a, a casing to help keep the liquids inside of the batteries. But in our case, we made a casing material that is made out of liquid metal. This is a picture of it. So the battery is inside of here and the liquid metal is just the, the barrier packaging. And if you measure the mass versus time, you'll see that there's no change in mass because this is a really good stretchable barrier. But if you don't have the liquid metal, the water will slowly diffuse through the, the silicone and, and come out. So this is interesting because it breaks a trade-off that, that basically people thought was a, uh, you know, insurmountable. In addition to it, the metal being a liquid, it also has, of course, conductivity because it is a metal. So in this video, which I'll play in a second as a little bit of sound, is uh, showing this liquid metal wire that's inside of a, a rubber tube. And here, hopefully you can hear, um, there's some sound that's coming through this headphone. And as the music plays, you can stretch this wire a lot. We don't get any degradation in sound quality because you get the conductivity of a metal and the stretchability of rubber. So you kind of get the best of both worlds. Um, I'm going to come back to that a, a little bit more in just a second. But one of the kind of the really key things for a lot of the work that we do is taking advantage of what's called the native oxide. Basically, the metal reacts with air and forms an oxide on it. And aluminum does the same thing. So aluminum is very reactive and it will react with air and form a very thin oxide, but that oxide protects the metal from additional reactions. And with liquid metal, it does exactly the same thing. So this is a picture of the oxide layer. It's a few nanometers thick in this particular example, about three nanometers. So inside of here is the liquid metal. Out, outside of here would be air, for example. And because of this oxide, it protects the metal from additional reactions. In addition to protecting the metal, it also has some major impacts on other properties. And that's what I'm going to spend some time talking about. So coming back to this, this slide again, this is a, a summary of different ways to pattern the metal. Another way is to take advantage of this oxide layer that forms on the liquid metal. So this demonstrated in this video where we dispense liquid metal from a syringe. And you can see that if you pull the liquid back into the syringe, you can see the oxide layer wrinkle on the surface. And this oxide layer forms so fast and is sufficiently strong that you can start making three-dimensional shapes. This is interesting because for the first time you can actually print metals at room temperature. Now they're not strong. Uh, this whole thing is still a liquid and it's all held together by the, uh, the, the oxide layer. But you imagine if you did this with water, you would just end up with a big puddle of water. But here, because of the oxide, we can form these 3D shapes. The oxide forms so fast that if you do a burst of pressure, you can see you can form a fiber. 
And that fiber is like a, still a liquid, so you can move it and it's conductive. And then this is a dead bug. Maybe you can see the, the eyes here. It's sort of just a funny video, but um, it shows really this is a, truly a gentle process. We're doing this at room temperature and uh, these structures are quite small. They're on the order of a few hundred microns. Now, if you were to remove the oxide, which we can do using acid or base, uh, if you remove it, so here's some base, this is sodium hydroxide. You can see that you can, you can break up the metal into droplets but it very quickly goes back together. This is another interesting thing about gallium. It has the largest surface tension of any liquid at room temperature. It's about 10 times that of water, so it's really large. And as a consequence, it tends to want to form spherical shapes. But we discovered something, actually we discovered this on accident um, a few years ago. And that is, if you apply a voltage to the metal, so you can see here's a wire, and we stick it into the liquid metal, and we apply a positive voltage. So we're gonna try to cause oxidation on the surface of the metal. What you would expect to happen is that you should form oxide on the surface and that's it. But um, in these particular conditions, we actually find that the surface tension gets lowered a lot. So here we apply the voltage, you can see the counter electrode over here, and you'll see that the metal spreads a lot um, in, this, in this mold. Now, um, a couple of details here. You can see that the bubbles that are forming here, those are hydrogen. So the liquid metal is getting oxidized and the water is getting reduced to form hydrogen bubbles. The other thing, you see the surface is shiny. So we're forming a little bit of oxide on the surface, not much. And the key thing is that we, we're doing this in sodium hydroxide, which constantly dissolves off the oxide that forms on the surface. As a consequence, the metal can, can flow in these, um, these molds. So when we first saw this, we thought, well, this is probably what's called electrocapillarity. Electrocapillarity is a theory that's been known since the late 1800s. And basically what it, what it is is a change in surface tension with electrical potential. And the idea is, is shown here. This is a plot of surface tension versus potential. And you can see that if, imagine this is your liquid metal droplet inside of an electrolyte. And if you don't do anything, the surface tension is very large, like 600. That's almost 10 times out of water. But if you wanna make the surface tension lower, if you apply voltage, you can bring charge uh, to the surface. And when you do, let's say you apply a positive voltage to the metal, you should bring um, anions of from the electrolyte to the surface. And it shouldn't matter if you apply a negative voltage or positive voltage, either way, you should get a parabola. The equation that describes this is the surface tension, which is what we're plotting, is equal to the surface tension at the point of zero charge, that's up here where there's no charge, minus one half CV squared. That's the energy for a capacitor, which is exactly what this looks like. And if you look at this equation, you say, well, this is, this is great. You just apply a big voltage and you can make the surface tension any value you want. But this is data from 1965 and they actually stopped measuring because they started getting bubbles. They started getting electric electrolysis. So for a number of reasons, we don't, we actually know it's not electrocapillarity. So this is the main point. It's not electrocapillarity. For one reason, we don't see symmetry. If I were to go back in my slide, we should see symmetry um, if we apply positive or negative voltage. And in our case, if we apply a positive voltage, we oxidize the surface and the tension goes is low. In negative voltage, it actually removes the oxide and the metal beads up. And actually, you can see hydrogen bubbles coming off the surface here. So it's not electrocapillarity. What is it? Well, to, to understand this better, what we do is we measure the shape of a droplet of the metal, and we apply a voltage using a very small wire, as shown here. And the shape is a balance of gravitational forces, which we know because we know the density and we know gravity. And then the, the only other force we don't know is a surface tension. So as we apply the voltage, the surface tension gets lower, the droplet should change shape, and then we can, we can measure the surface tension. So here's our experiment. Again, this is a droplet of liquid metal. There's a little wire, which you can't see, which is here. And it's sitting in sodium hydroxide, which is uh, the electrolyte. And there's a counter electrode right here, which you can't see. And when we, we don't apply any voltage, this is what's called open circuit voltage. It's, it says negative 1.5, but we're actually not applying a voltage. We get a very large surface tension, almost 500. Remember, water is like 70. Water is down here. So we're getting a very, very large surface tension. However, when we start the experiment, we start applying a voltage. So we go a little bit positive. You can see the droplet starts squishing. 
basically the tension gets lower and we can control this over go back and forth completely reversible and so um this is very strange but also very very interesting because you might remember that what the theory says is that the surface tension which is this axis uh, should form a parabola this is the classic theory from the 1800s but what we observe is, is at low voltages, we actually observe it, it follows the theory. These are da experimental data points. This is exactly what you would expect. However, as soon as the oxidation starts to occur, we get anomalous behavior. It starts to drop. So it's, again, not electric capillarity. It's something to do with oxidation. And we're actually still trying to understand this um, at a deeper level. So why would oxidation lower the surface tension? Well, one possibility is that the species that we're depositing are kind of like surfactants. Um, surfactant is something like soap that goes to the interface between two immiscible liquids, like oil and water. And in our case, we apply our, our soap um, with one volt, and we lower the surface tension. We think it's very, very low. And then negative one volt makes it go away, and the, the metal will beat up. So with soap, it's very easy to put soap into water, but very difficult to remove it. Here, we can remove it or deposit it re completely reversibly. So I'd like to give a shout out to one of the panelists, um, Xiang, who I've got pictured here and you'll see in just a little bit. Uh, he and some collaborators did this really beautiful work where they took liquid metal droplets and they put them into a state of high surface tension. So no oxide layer. And because of that tension, the drop, the liquid wants to form a ball. And so that force is that, uh, sufficient to hold up this weight. But when you lower the surface tension by applying voltage, uh, the weight squishes it down, and then it's completely reversible. So this is sort of a, a, a muscle-like material um, in which the force is coming from the surface tension. So this is really a beautiful example of, of taking advantage of this. And there's other really nice work by uh, Carmel Majidi's group that, um, that, that does similar things. So if I'm going back to our data for a second, and again, um, this is voltage, and this is our surface tension. And over here is exactly what we expected from theory. This is where there's no oxide on the, on the metal. But shortly after we start forming oxide, you see the tension gets lower and lower and lower. And I drew this, um, this green line. This is not scientific at all, but it's just to kind of guide your eye and say, well, gosh, that looks like the surface tension might be zero. Um, and you remember the, re the, the way that we measure these data points is by looking at the shape of the drop. So high surface tension, low surface tension. The reason we don't have a data point right here is because the droplet actually never uh, achieves a steady state shape. So let me show you what happens if you apply this voltage right here. And this is some work that I've done with Karen Daniels, my colleague. So you're looking top down on the droplet of liquid metal and the electrode is right here. So we're applying um, about 0 0.7, 0 0.8 volts. And, um, and the, the metal actually looks like it has no surface tension. It just spreads out. And remember, this is the liquid with the largest surface tension known to man at room temperature. So very strange. How, when these things, uh, when the metal breaks away, you can see that um, whatever was on the surface dissolves away because remember, this is in sodium hydroxide. So as soon as it loses electrical connection with the electrode right here, it just beads back up. So the, the takeaway from this is somehow this electrochemical oxidation, not, not just regular oxidation, electrochemical oxidation is uh, lowering the surface tension a lot. And one of the implications of this is that you can overcome Rayleigh instabilities. This is a fancy word for basically dripping. You know, if you, if you turn on a faucet or hose, you will form droplets. And you might think, well, okay, fine, it forms droplets. But what, if, what about if I increase the flow rate? And if you do, you can form what's called a jet. So this is a jet of water coming out of a nozzle, but still you're going to form droplets, which you can see here. Now, the, the time that it takes for droplets to, to form um, is a function of the diameter of your nozzle. So the smaller the nozzle, the, the less time it takes. And the larger your surface tension, um, the, the, the less time it takes. So if we do this with liquid metal, so here's our liquid metal coming through a nozzle. This nozzle is 100 microns. That's the size of a human hair. So if we pump the metal, of course we form droplets, just as you would expect. But if you note here, we're starting to apply voltage. And you'll notice that the droplets get smaller and smaller, which means the tension is getting lower and lower. And at some point, 
0.7, which is exactly where we see those fractals, it comes out as a wire, which suggests the tension is basically zero. Now, if you apply too big of a voltage, you get some very strange looking behavior because the oxide gets too thick and it can't flow regularly. So we decided to, to find the tallest container in our lab that is transparent to see if we can make the, the, these things really long. So here's our nozzle. Again, it looks like this. It's 100 microns, the size of a human hair. Here's the counter electrode, and this material is uh, sodium hydroxide. So I'm going to point to the, this wire. I'm going to let this video play. But where I'm pointing is the wire. This is incredible because, um, again, this is the liquid with the largest surface tension known to man. And it's forming, I mean, it's, you can barely see it. Um, and it's forming this very long wire, even though the surface tension should be very large. So again, this is a, happening because of oxidation. I'm going to give a shout out to my daughter um, because uh, she has very long hair. And so this is a picture of her. And if you can maybe focus like right here, you can see one of her individual hairs. This is the geometry that we just made in the previous video out of liquid metal, which is the largest surface tension of any liquid. So it's pretty, pretty amazing. My friends in, uh, in Wollongong, um, Professor Zhao Lin, who's pictured here, came up with a very clever idea of how to use this. And uh, the idea is, you might remember from freshman physics, this idea of the, the right hand or the left hand rules looks something like this. And the idea is if you have current um, normal to a magnetic field, you generate a force. And in our case, we have a current, this is our, our nozzle, this is the liquid metal. Um, and we have current because remember, we're oxidizing the liquid metal. In other words, we're re removing electrons. So we have current. If we put a magnet field behind it, we should generate a force. Now there's another effect that's called Lenz's law. And that's basically says that if you have a conductor like liquid metal and you move it through a magnetic field, it will sort of slow down at the edge of the magnetic field where the, the field lines diverge like this. Okay, so we're gonna see both of those effects in a really beautiful way. Here's our nozzle, here's the liquid metal, and we're gonna pump it. And if you didn't know any better, you would think that this should form droplets. But as I just showed you, it's gonna form a wire. And as that wire passes by this magnet, you'll see the effect of Lorentz force and Lenz's law. So here it goes. Lorentz force causes it to move outwards, and then Lenz's law causes it to stop at the edge of the magnet. It's really beautiful. I just want to emphasize gravity is going down. Gravity is going this way. So anyway, all right, so I'll show you one more. Here you can use multiple magnets. Um, and you can control it with north and south polarity, that kind of thing. And then you'll see it looks like smoke, but this is hydrogen bubbles that are coming from the, the counter electrode. So anyway, if um, I like to challenge people to go home, maybe after this talk, and try to make a liquid stream in your kitchen out of water and try to make it the size of a human hair. And if you're able to do that, which you won't be able to, uh, then try to get it to move in air. Um, it'll be very difficult to do. So this is kind of interesting. It's another way to pattern the metal. Now, coming, coming back to this slide about the amazing properties, um, I mentioned, you know, it's a liquid, but uh, the melting point is close enough to room temperature that you can get gallium to be a solid. And so I've just, just got one little video here, but it shows um, a wire, which we've made out of gallium inside of a rubber tube, and it's very stiff. So it's in the solid phase. However, if we put it into warm water, we can melt it and make it very soft. So this is interesting. Other people have taken advantage of this to make variable stiffness materials, materials that can go from being hard to, to soft and, and back again. I'd like to, to spend the rest of my time talking about some of the interesting fundamentals that are enabled by uh, the liquid metal properties. And one of the very unusual properties is the wetting properties. This is a picture I found on the internet. I don't recommend doing this, but you know, if you were to hold this in your hand, you might notice that there's some kind of residue that, go, that would end up on your skin. So what is that? Well, that turns out to be basically oxide along with some liquid metal that gets trapped in there. And so um, we, and as well as others, there's some inspirational work by Rebecca Kramer and J.B. Lee uh, down in Dallas um, about uh, basically taking advantage of the oxide layer to either promote or uh, avoid adhesion. So if you take a piece 
of material. It's, in this case, it's a piece of plastic and it's not coated. It's just flat, smooth. You put a droplet of liquid metal on it and then you try to remove the liquid metal. It sticks to the surface. So this is good and bad. It's bad if you want to remove the metal, but it's good if you if you want the metal to, to stay on your surface. So what we show here, and again, this is um, building off pr prior work, that if you coat the surface with particles and, or something to make it rough, uh, you can't actually see it by eye because the particles are really small. But if you look under an electron microscope, you can see the particles here. So these are silica particles, which we basically, uh, there's a little trick to get them to stick to the surface. Then when you put the, the droplet of liquid metal on there and then you remove it, you, you can remove it. And that's because these particles prevent the oxide from making good contact with the substrate. Basically, they're, they keep the oxide from, from making contact. So to, to show you this just in another way, on the left is a rough surface. This is a smooth surface. This is a high-speed camera. And you'll see on a rough surface, the droplets will bounce off the surface. They don't stick. But on the smooth surface, when this droplet comes down, it sticks, it hits the surface, it flattens, and it sticks. So the point is that the oxide enables the metal to stick to, to, rough sur or to smooth surfaces, not rough surfaces. Normally, when people characterize uh, wetting behavior of liquids, they use what's called contact angle, which is the angle that you'd see like here in the case of water. But for a long time, I've, I've asked myself this question, does contact angle really mean anything if your droplet has a shell wrapped around it? So here is our oxide shell on the liquid metal, and, and you can see the contact angle here is uh, it's quite big. So I saw a lot of papers in the literature that were using contact angle, and I was really skeptical. And so we, pr we published this sort of provocative title, Are Contact Angle Measurements Useful for Oxide-Coated Liquid Metals? And the short answer is basically no. <laughs> They're a little bit useful, but not that useful. They're sort of misused. So let me explain. This is um, what people typically do when they measure contact angle. They do what's called advancing angle, which is where you, you pump liquid into your droplet and you basically the droplet expands. And then, um, and then you pull the liquid back in and it recedes. So here you pull the liquid back in. This is the contact angle measured as a function of volume. So here's our initial droplet. This is a droplet of water and we advance it. This would be called the advancing contact angle. And then we recede it. This would be called the receding contact angle. Let me show you what happens with liquid metal. Here is a droplet on a substrate and we advance it by adding liquid metal. And you can see the contact angle is very high, about 150. And we wait and if you watch this, droplet, first of all, it will sag. It actually spreads out a little bit. And then it pins right here, and it never really recedes. And what we found, we did this on many, many surfaces, and basically the oxide-coated metal sticks to almost every smooth surface that we tried. Um, there's a few exceptions, but basically it sticks to almost every surface. So now I'm plotting here is the, the behavior of the liquid metal. If we advance the droplet, you can see we get a, a very reproducible number, about 150. This number depends in a subtle way on the substrate, but it's always high. It's always between 140 and say 150. Um, and so my suggestion is if you want to take a contact angle, to use advancing contact angle because it's actually um, reproducible. However, when we start to recede it, it looks like it's starting to recede, but all, actually all that's doing is just sagging. It's not actually receding. And then you see that the, the edge pins and uh, the angle gets smaller, but it never recedes. So what is the point here? If you just stick a droplet on a surface and you're not careful, you could have an angle that's all the way between 150 degrees down to, I don't know, maybe 20 degrees. So you could go from this all the way to this, just based on the way that the droplet is handled. That's not good. <laughs> so do not, I highly encourage people to not use static contact angle because it doesn't mean anything. You should be using advancing angles. All right, so coming back to this, um, talking about the wetting behavior. Well, if, if you remove the oxide layer, um, you can actually take advantage of wetting um, to pattern the metal. And so what I've shown you until now is with the oxide, but if you remove the oxide, you can actually wet metals. 
So if we take liquid metal with no oxide, it will wet. It's called reactive wetting. It will form metal-metal bonds with other metals. So here is a, uh, a flexible circuit cable that's got copper on it and, uh, and polyimide, which is the polymer. And we're, there's a, this liquid here is sodium hydroxide, which removes the oxide. So you see as, as we just move this droplet across the surface, it will wet the copper because it reactively wets with it, but it will not wet the polymer. Basically, without the oxide, the metal doesn't wet any surface other than metals. So you can use this in a clever way to, uh, to pattern liquid metals on copper. More recently, we've used this wetting um, between gallium and, and copper to do something that's very interesting, and that is adjust the rheology of the, of the liquid metal. So if you just simply pump liquid metal out of a nozzle, you're gonna form a droplet very similar to water. And for patterning, what we would really like is for it to come out as a cylinder, more like toothpaste, like a paste. So how do we do this? How do we modify the, the rheology of liquid metal? Well, there's a number of really beautiful ways that are shown in the literature, but we took a, a slightly different approach, which is to take advantage of these capillary forces that I just have been talking about. So this is a, a, a boy playing in very, very wet sand. And as you know, if it's very, very wet, you cannot build a sandcastle. However, uh, this girl who's, uh, I have two daughters, so I always say girls are, are smarter than boys, but <laughs> maybe that's controversial. A uh, girl here is building this beautiful sandcastle by using um, the wetting between liquid, which is in this case water, and the sand particles. And that capillary bridge, it's called a pendular bridge, will hold those particles together. So we thought, well, what if we replace the sand with copper? And what if we replace the water with liquid metal? So let me flash back and forth be like this. Okay, so if we could do that, we could make, not only we can make a paste, but we could also um, make conductive, a conductive bridge between the particles. So here is uh, what we did. These are the copper particles connected by uh, the liquid metal. And they're formed in a relatively simple way. You just take the copper particles, liquid metal, and some water with pH 1. pH 1 because we don't want to have the oxide present. And we just mix these together very aggressively. And when we do, we make an ink that we can push out of a nozzle and we can print metallic, conductive metallic structures. Now, one of the details here is as we push the metal through this nozzle, the particles, the liquid metal particles get elongated. And so there's some anisotropy. What does that mean? That means it's more difficult for it to shrink this way than this way. Why does it shrink? Well, we've got water that evaporates. So after you print it, the water evaporates. And so again, we're gonna get more shrinkage in this direction than in this direction. And that allows us to control the stress. So here's a really beautiful example where we print this flower shape and you'll notice the lattices are um, perpendicular to each other. So we get bending. And if you make the, uh, the lattices at a 45 degree angle, you can actually get twisting. And again, this is all happening because these materials are drying. And as they dry, there's a little bit of polymer that we put into these inks and that causes the material um, to shrink. As basically, it's, a, it's like a gel that surrounds it that, that uh, exerts some stress. So you might think, well, what if I want to print this and I don't want it to shrink? Well, then you just let it dry at room temperature. And in that case, the stress is relaxed and it doesn't change shape. So this is just to show that it is drift by evaporation. At the end of the day, um, the material is conductive. So this is a spider uh, that we printed. It's really cool with these glow-in-the-dark um, LED eyes. Okay. Two more properties I want to bring to your attention. So super cooling. This is a topic that uh, that our host, uh, Martin, is, is really an expert at. So we, um, well, first of all, let, let me explain what super cooling is. So the idea is that liquids can super cool. That means that they can go to temperatures below their freezing point. So for example, water is super cooled if it's a liquid below zero degrees Celsius. How does this happen? Well, if it's very pure water, and if you have it in a very smooth container, like a water bottle, you can actually get water to be a liquid below zero degrees Celsius. However, in this little clip, which I took from YouTube, um, if you pour the water into a dish, the dish is rough. And so the water will freeze when it contacts a rough surface. This is called heterogeneous nucleation. Basically, there's little rough spots on the surface 
causes it to freeze. So it wants to freeze, but it can't until it touches a rough surface. So we had a hypothesis that's basically, I'll, I'll read it here. The oxide provides an atomically smooth container that minimizes heterogeneous nucleation. That's kind of a mouthful, but you can see here that the basic idea that if you have a surface, let's say you have a droplet of liquid metal and it's on a surface, and there's these little nucleation sites, the gallium, which wants to freeze, will not because it's got this really smooth container. It's, it's oxide layer that holds it um, and keeps it from touching the surface. Um, so this was done in collaboration with Chung, who uh, worked with a student in my group. Um, and uh, Chung is, um, works with Khan, who is uh, also a visiting scholar in our lab. So let's look at gallium for a second. Gallium freezes at, uh, excuse me, melts at 30 degrees. It should freeze at 30 degrees, but question mark, where does it freeze? We can measure the freezing point by doing what's called uh, differential scanning calorimetry. Basically, you, uh, you, you cool down the, the material. So here we're cooling it down. It's a liquid, it's a liquid. And then when you see these peaks, that means you get a freezing event. So you can see that the, even though gallium melts at 30 degrees, it freezes as, as low as say negative 20 or, or even lower if you use particles. Now, if we remove the oxide, which we can do using acid, um, you'll notice that now it freezes closer to the, the melting point. So about 10 degrees Celsius, 10 to five, something like that. So this suggests that our hypothesis might be correct. Um, I'm saying this in a very humble way because this is some evidence, but this is really difficult to study. One more piece of evidence here is we took gallium, a droplet of liquid gallium, and put it in cold acid. So there's no oxide layer here, and it's sitting on a, on a wafer. So here it's kind of sped up. You'll see, oh, it freezes. And the way you can tell it freezes is because it, it forms a crystal, and so it's no longer spherical shape. If you do put gallium in cold water, so now there is oxide, uh, you can see that it kind of, nothing happens. It stays as a liquid. So the oxide is helping to keep it from nucleating. At the very end of the video, we stick a wire into it uh, just to make sure it's a liquid. And, and actually, when you stick the wire in, it will nucleate and freeze. So that's actually our trick to get it to, to freeze. Um, another interesting property of liquid metals is you can make particles very, very easily. So we and, and actually other groups, including Martin, who's uh, again um, moderating this call, um, have made particles by just simply putting energy in, into these into the liquid metal. So here we take a vial of liquid metal, we vibrate it, or in Martin's case, they basically stir it and uh, form particles. And this is what it looks like. This is liquid metal sitting in ethanol. We sonicate it, which again is just vibrations, and we can form a suspension of little particles that are stabilized by that oxide layer. Well, recently we um, we did something, and um, I think I'd like to share it with you. It's kind of interesting. If you take those particles and you cast them onto a, a, a an elastomeric substrate that's a little bit sticky, uh, the film, even though you would think it should be conductive, it's not a very good conductor, mostly because I believe because of the oxide. So we dry it, we we let the solvent evaporate. But then what's interesting is if you stretch it, stretch the material, the particles will partially merge together and become a very good conductor. We then release it back to its original strain, back to zero strain, and um, we measure the conductivity and it's indeed conductive. And so this is kind of a simple way to, to make conductive films with high surface area. And um, one of the interesting properties of this, and, and we're not the only ones to have observed this, there's quite a few examples now in the literature that show that if you measure the resistance versus strain, so this what we're doing is stretching from zero to 600% strain. That's a lot of strain. Um, the, the green data is our data. We see very little change in resistance. Geometrically, just by making a wire longer and, and the cross-section narrower, you would expect um, this blue data. This is called Poulier's Law, and you would expect the resistance to go way up. But in our case with these films, the resistance barely changes. Um, and so this is something maybe we can talk about during the Q&A, because um, this is sort of an open question as, of, as to why this works. You can also take these same particles and coat them onto textiles to make electronic textiles. So here we take a, a fabric, we dip it into the solution with these particles, we dry it so there's no solvent, and we, we take the pure textile, which here's one of those fibers, and you can see it makes this beautiful coating of particles, densely packed particles. We didn't do anything special, we just dipped it in there. And these, again, are not conductive. 
Previously, I showed we stretch them to make them conductive, but you can also actually just push on them. This is an idea that's called mechanical centering that uh, Rebecca Kramer and Carmel Majidi uh, sort of pioneered. Uh, and so what we did is we took this fabric and it's coated with particles, but we squished it. We basically pushed on it and made a conductive circuit that lights up this LED and then goes over here. Now, what's interesting in this particular case is that again, there's, there's particles even over here, they're just, they're insulating. So if we cut this piece of fabric, we're gonna cut through our circuit right here. You'll see that the light stays on. And the reason it does this is because the, the mechanical forces of the scissors cause those particles to merge together and form a new conductive path. So now there's a new conductive path here. This was inspired by some work, uh, some self-healing work done by uh, Mike Bartlett, Carmel Majidi, and, uh, and, and that group at Carnegie Mellon. But here we've applied that same principle to uh, to a fabric. And then again, this is uh, taking advantage of particle films. Um, if you take those particles and you add a polymer to it, this is a special polymer called polyamic acid, we can just simply spray it onto a surface and form a film. But again, the film is not conductive. So then we take laser and we can pattern that film. And you can hear we made the wolf, like in our, our mascot is, is the wolf. Um, and it's, uh, that's conductive. And it actually, not only is it conductive, it makes the, the film have higher surface area. So this is the film as we cast it with the liquid metal particles, a little bit of the polymer. And then with the laser, it, it actually expands and forms carbon. So we make a composite film of liquid metal and carbon that is uh, highly conductive and it's also stretchable. So the, the, one of the neat things about it is in the regions that you don't center, you can actually remove them. So here we've, we've got our film, we, we pattern it. And you can see the patterns, which again are made by the laser. And there's underneath this film is a sacrificial polymer, uh, PVA, which if you submerge this into water, the water will go under the film and release it. So the, again, this region here, which is not conductive, we don't really want it there. Uh, we can dissolve it away and remove it from the substrate, leaving behind only the, um, the, the laser exposed regions. I'm very proud of this work because the first author is a, an undergrad that worked in my lab for four years to make this, this project happen. And uh, he worked with a really good graduate mentor, Suik, uh, who mentored him. Uh, Ethan is now a PhD student at MIT and, and doing really well. Okay, so, um, Reactivity. I'm going to sort of skip over this property because Kurash gave a beautiful talk about a week ago talking about the reactivity of liquid metal, but just know it is reactive. I'll show one example from our group and then move on to the last topic. Um, but anyway, the, the idea here is that liquid metals can drive reactions because they uh, they're tend to be very reactive. So they're, um, well, just check out Kurash's talk. He'll explain it better than me. Uh, but what we what we were showing here is uh, something very interesting where we take a droplet of liquid metal and we put it into water with monomer. Monomer is the, mo the molecules that ultimately can form polymers. Usually when you want to cause polymerization, you have to add another molecule called an initiator. An initiator is a special molecule that causes, in this case, free radicals. And in our case, um, we sonicate the liquid metal and all we were trying to do was just form droplets. But what we discovered is that it actually causes the, the monomer to polymerize and we formed a gel. So when you turn it over, it's no longer liquid. You can see it's now polymerized. We're continuing and other people are working in this space. Um, these gels have very interesting mechanical properties. So not only does the liquid metal initiate the polymerization, but it also changes um, the properties of the gel that forms. Happy to talk about this more during the, the Q&A. But there's just one last topic um, that I wanna to touch on and then I'll, I'll be done. And that is that metals can form what's called an electric double layer. This is not special to gallium. Uh, I believe all metals do this. So if you take a, a surface like a metal and you put it into uh, water, here's bulk water, it will naturally form what's called an electrical double layer at the surface. These are ions that naturally segregate um, to the surface. And... Um, and so these are these have been used in what's called electrochemical uh, double layer capacitors. So they've been used to store energy, but not uh, not convert um, 
we're excuse me, we're using as it a, as an energy um, conversion mechanism. So our idea is if you could, instead of using a solid, if you could use a liquid, you could actually change the area of this interface. So here we take a, a droplet of liquid metal. This is a, a cartoon uh, made by this amazing student, Colin Ladd. Uh, and the idea is to take this droplet of liquid metal, put it into a hydrogel, which is this transparent material, kind of like contact lens material that's got a bunch of ions in it. The ions naturally go to the interface between the liquid metal and the hydrogel. There's a second capacitor that's sitting over here. And when you squish the metal, the charge goes through and then it goes back. It goes this way and then it goes back. And the idea is when you increase the surface area, you increase the capacitance. So it's a way of making a dynamic circuit where you can convert mechanical energy into electricity. So that's our goal. We make these in a very easy way. This is the hydrogel. We pour the solution in a mold. As you can see here, we um, polymerize it with UV and then now you can see it's molded. So that's our hydrogel. Again, it's mostly water with some polymer. We then put liquid metal inside of it and encapsulate it with more gel and polymerize it. And the end result is something that's very soft and very stretchy. So we can take this, we can stretch it, we can squish it, we can twist it. Anything that we do that changes the surface area will generate electricity. So we characterize it by squishing it, we push on it. And when we change the area, you can see that it charges, discharge, charge, discharge. So what we're doing is converting mechanical energy into electricity. So just to kind of summarize the idea here, we're taking liquid metals, which are shown here, these two squares, putting them in gel, and we're making a soft device when, where we can deform it to change the area. This is the equation. It's very simple. It's just like freshman physics. What it says is the change in capacitance is equal or proportional to the change in area. So we're taking advantage of the fact that the gel and the liquid metal are soft and stretchable, that we can actually change their capacitance by changing their area. We're also taking advantage of D being very small in electric double layer. So you actually get very large capacitances. And so that's favorable because you want D to be small in order to maximize the amount of charge. And then usually you need a, a voltage supply for, uh, for capacitors where the area changes. But here there's no battery. This is just happening thermodynamically. And um, well, kind of one interesting thing is that you need salt water. Uh, usually electronics don't like salt water, but here we're actually using it intentionally. So I'll summarize by, I've, I've tried to walk you through all these interesting properties. And I know I went a little fast. I know that uh, I didn't go into a lot of depth on any one of these topics, but my goal was to basically show you that there's really unique properties of these materials. Um, I'll highlight a couple of them here. One is the, this native oxide that allows us to pattern the metal into shapes that are useful for stretchable electronics. Um, the wetting is very interesting, very unusual. Um, and then uh, the reactivity is, is, as I mentioned in Kurash's talk, showed really beautifully how that could be used for catalysis. I'll, I'll go ahead and speculate here since I see I have a minute or two left, um, but um, potential opportunities to, uh, to, to grow in this field. One is that um, Kurash and some other groups have shown that you can separate the oxide from the metal. So that's really interesting. If you can take the oxide, remove it from the metal, now you have a way of depositing oxides at low temperatures. So there's a number of groups working in this space and I think it's very exciting. Better understanding of the interfacial properties, um, this electrochemical, not only electrochemical, but also in air. And they're very different, but, um, but understanding what's happening at the interface is very important. And this is an expertise actually of Martin. Um, and then composites. There's a lot of people working in this space, putting liquid metals with other materials to make um, interesting function. The soft devices is kind of the theme of my talk. This is a, a nature paper from a few years ago that used liquid metal wires and this artificial eye. Um, I didn't talk about it, but gallium has really amazing antibacterial properties. So there's some groups, um, one of which is, is my friend Khan who uh, are taking advantage of this to kill bacteria. I mentioned Karash and the catalysis and then the reactivity. All this work was done by an amazing group of students and collaborators. So this is a picture of our group from this past May. We went to get some ice cream. Uh, so lots of smiling faces. Uh, very lucky to work with these amazing students. And, uh, and I, I owe them a big debt of gratitude. 
I hope I didn't miss saying anybody's name along the way because I'm very grateful for all the collaborators and friends and former students who I've gotten to work with. And then um, I'd like to thank the folks that, that made this possible over the, the years. And then last but not least, there's a couple of review articles in case you want to learn a little bit more. Um, I'll, I'll leave them here. And with that, I will stop and be very happy to take questions if, if time allows. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michael. That was fantastic. That was a, a big journey uh, through Liquid Meadows. And uh, uh, these materials never stop to surprises. There's always something in store for us and something uh, non-conventional. So thank you very much. And uh, at this point, I would like to introduce uh, our panelists. Um, if I may. Yep. So, uh, Michael, I'm going to share my slides now. Um, and uh, okay, sorry, my settings are um, I'm messed up. So, um, our panelists, um, I'll start with the uh, Xian Tang. Uh, he's not uh, new to this uh, uh, community. Um, he is, uh, as, as you saw in Michael's talk, he has done quite a bit of work in, in this area and um, is uh, well known among the different metal uh, community. So very, very, very briefly, uh, Xian Tang is an associate professor in the School of Electronic and Computer Science at the University of Southampton in the UK. He received a fast class uh, Honors uh, Bachelor of Engineering degree in Micromechanical Systems, MEMS, in, uh, from Melbourne. And then uh, he went to uh, Penn, Penn State and then University of California, San Diego, uh, San Francisco uh, for postdoc. Um, then he was the vice chancellor's postdoctoral research in uh, Wollong, Wollongong, sorry, I butchered that word, in uh, Australia. Uh, and then before joining uh, Southampton, uh, Southampton, where he's uh, doing some great uh, work in, in, in liquid metal. He has so many awards, I'm not going to get into all of them. So please uh, allow me to just jump uh, to uh, to the other uh, panelists. The other pa uh, panelist is uh, uh, Wei Lao, who is a professor at the uh, Technical Institute of Physics and Chemistry in the Chinese Academy of Science. Uh, is, she does a very interdisciplinary work and covers the material science of liquid metals and uh, micro or nanomaterials. She's very well published uh, with uh, over 100 uh, papers in very prestigious journals uh, and uh, has received quite a few awards. And uh, I want to highlight uh, that um, he, she was the recipient of the Fallen Talents Program by TAPC. Uh, to translate her work and, 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 and her technology. Welcome, uh, Professor Rao. Our next uh, panelist, again, is another uh, familiar face to ICANN X. Uh, uh, Yu Jiang is a chair professor at the Department of Biomedical Engineering of the Southern University of Science and Technology. Uh, he obtained his uh, bachelor's degree from University of Chicago, and then a PhD from Harvard, uh, and then after a short postdoc, uh, he moved to Chinese Academy of Science. Uh, and then in 2018, he moved to uh, Southern University of Science and Technology. He is a, he's an OD of many, many uh, awards. And I want to highlight the Human Frontier uh, Science Program Award, among many others. And our challenger today uh, is um, Minxing uh, Kong. Um, he received his BS in Material Science and Engineering uh, from Pohang University of Science and Technology, post in 2016. Then a PhD um, uh, in the same department. He's now a postdoc uh, in the same group. And his research includes interface, uh, interfacing issues in soft electronics, electronic devices, and characterization of surface oxides in liquid metal. Welcome, everybody. And uh, as is uh, the tradition here, we give the first question to our challenger to ask our speaker the first questions. Okay, um, should I begin? Yep, go ahead. Okay, 
Uh, Fer, thank you very much for uh, Dr. Dickey for your wonderful, insightful talk. It was a great time for me, falling in love with Nick Meta once again. <laughs> so actually, I have like a. Uh, Three simple questions, I think, uh, with one silly question as a first. So, like, um, you showed us like uh, uh printing liquid metal droplets as a, um with like a three D printing, and is there any like a uh, um interaction between the particles? Because like it seems like it sticks to each other when those particles approach each other um before actual contact happens so like do you think there is any like a strong and long distance interaction between the particles like even breaking the oxides in between that's a great question <laughs> oh man i should should have uh, invited a less smart challenger <laughs> <laughs> um okay so so let me let me answer it superficially, and then we can talk a little, maybe a little bit deeper. So, what a, a lot of people are when I show that video, they get very curious about what happens if you have two droplets and they approach each other. You know what what happens to the oxide? So that's one one part of the question. That's not exactly what you asked, but I want to address that first. Um, we have I don't have it here, I, otherwise I'd show it, but um, we have high speed video cam camera images that basically show the droplets partially merge. So I believe what happens is when they when they touch each other uh, or get in very close proximity, the oxide layer will break and the metal will connect together. And the the other proof for that is if you try to pull the particles back apart, you can see they they don't go back apart like spheres. They 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 kind of stick together. Um, and so part of that could just be simply geometry, right? If you try to take a round surface like a, a ball and try to make it flat, you're going to have to have some strain, some deformation. And this is what people have called the map makers problem. It's like if you try to take the earth and try to make it flat, you're going to have some distortions to, uh, to certain parts of the map. And the same thing will happen if you touch two droplets of, of liquid. Now, the deeper part of your question, the part that I don't know is as you get closer, is it simply just mechanical, like you touch them together? And that's it, or is there some forces that would occur at um, before they actually make physical contact? And for that, the short answer is I don't know. Um, I think in in our particular case, we're not doing anything to ground these materials. So if there's any electrostatic charge, you know, a little bit positive, a little bit negative, you could have potentially electrostatic forces. Of course, those are only strong enough at very small distances. Um, there's a so-called Casimir force, which is, as I understand it, sort of like Van der Waals force, but basically as molecules get closer together, they start to become attracted. Um, it would be, I think it's probably there. I don't see any reason why it wouldn't be, but the, the they occur at such short length scales that uh, at least we haven't studied it. It'd be very difficult to study. Um, that's a good question. It's really good. Uh, yeah, thank you very Can much. I just can I just yeah. jump in very quickly? Please, please. As a follow-up, do you think that uh, maybe capillary bridges do play a role? Because though we like to assume that uh, the surface oxide is the only thing on the particle, there's most likely a, 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 a layer of some mm. liquid on it. Yeah, and I don't think you, about that. Because you get these non hashing contacts, right? You don't get point contacts like in the metals. You have a very large surface area. So if there's even tiny amount of liquid, the capillary bridge you form on that is super, super strong, right? Yep. So it, it is, maybe that could be a possibility. I don't know, I'm speculating. Yeah, well, when you jumped in, I thought you were gonna help me answer the question, <laughs> but well, I'm, I'm, maybe, I'm, maybe you did, you ultimately did. So thank you for <laughs> turning that in from a question into a statement. <laughs> But yeah, I, 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 for sure, I don't see why not. That seems like another possibility. But again, you'd have to be pretty close together yeah. um, for that to happen. I'm a little scared if that was your silly question. <laughs> Thank you very much. It, it was, yourself. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Uh, my second question is actually, um, actually the gallium oxide 
is known to be like I mean, the it's easily etched in some kind of like a sodium oxide or hydrochloric acid and something right um does this etching process depends on the ph or like something else such as like i mean i i just want to know whether this liquid metal um um change the oxide or change the interaction between some solvents so like polarity of the solvents or like charge of the solvents um does this could change the oxide i mean the liquid metal behavior can we like measure this maybe with like young's equation we can we have like three forces and if, uh, when we know the two other forces can we like measure the interaction between the solvent and the liquid metal or like yeah i mean i don't yeah. know like it, it's a like a huge bunch of questions but yeah basically yeah, right. yeah. Can you measure the interaction between the solvents and like what actually um, makes the oxide etches? Mm. Yeah, yeah that, there's there's a bunch there. Um, this is another good question. So the work that's been done uh, to answer that question has been done by other groups. So I'm, I'm, it's a little dangerous for me, <laughs> for me to try, but let me try to summarize what I understand. Um, when you mentioned the, the pH, um, I was... There's a couple papers that come to mind. One is Rebecca Kramer's works where she looked at um, just comparing like acids versus bases. And I always get them confused. So I'm afraid to, to say, but I, I think the um, the base was etches faster, but it, it, of course it depends on the pH. Um, there's a there's a diagram that's called the poor bay diagram, which is, um, there's poor bay diagrams for basically all, all sorts of different materials. And the poor bay diagram is just simply based on thermodynamics. It's an energetic argument, and it basically shows um, one axis is voltage and one axis is pH, which is gets to your question. And it shows what would be the most stable species as a function of pH. So according to that diagram, if you get above about pH 10, the oxide should be unstable. It doesn't tell you anything about kinetics. How fast it's going to happen, but it just tells you if you give it enough time, what what should happen. And then if you go below, I think it's like pH three, uh, it should also be unstable. Now in practice, we found it to be a little different than that, like you know experimentally, but it's that's kind of a good rule of thumb uh, for starting. Um, and then you know once you've removed the oxide, now the metal is going to be in contact with the surroundings, whatever the surroundings are, whether it's sodium hydroxide or HCl. And for that, there's there's been a few papers, again, not, not from our group, but what they what they do is they take um they look at droplets of liquid metal. So kind of what you were saying, but they'll typically do it in like a pendant drop. So you you take a needle, there's a, a droplet on the end, and you look at the shape of the drop. The shape of the drop is dictated by gravitational forces, which want to just pull the droplet down, and surface tension, which wants to hold it up. So by looking at that shape, you can figure out the effect of the environment. And um, indeed, you know, if you have, just as a very silly, simple example, but if you have liquid gallium, no oxide and vacuum, that's the highest tension you're ever going to get because it's just surrounded by nothing. But if you then bring something like water into proximity, um, you can, you would change the, the surface tension just by the fact that it's got something butting up against the surface. Now, water is probably a bad example because as I mentioned, gallium is reactive. Gallium can react with the water. So that's, that's a complicating factor. And then everything I said assumes that everything would be neutral, uh, not, not reactive. Um, the amount that it affects the surface tension though is subtle. Uh, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head. But just for example, I think, don't quote me on these, but roughly uh, without the oxide, it's maybe like 600 millinewtons per meter. And then when you put it in water, it maybe 540 or something like that. So it's still really large surface tension. It's just not as large as it would be without, uh, without having that environment around it. I hope I got to the spirit of your question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I think I think it was... Yeah, it solved my questions. <laughs> okay. Okay.
Um, yeah, actually, the the last question was about the uh, liquid metal stretching because, like, you know, like um, when we stretch the liquid metal, the oxide will break and reform, and when we release the stress, uh, the form the oxide will have like wrinkles because it healed when it was stretched in stretch state, right? And these, when we repeat these, um, the oxide will be like reformed and reformed, theoretically consuming, like maybe could be uh, consume all the liquid metal inside, right? And mm -hmm. this could be actually much more cri critical when we use uh, as a composite, like a, when we make the particle as a nanoparticles or, yeah, yeah. I mean, like those kind of application, it will be quite qu critical. So, um, uh, can can you uh, can this possibly change the device you think or can this oxide quite um, I mean if the oxide is quite stable under I mean wrinkled oxide is quite stable it could be like there could be no other uh, further like cracks right mm -hmm. so yeah I mean could you could you explain about the actually you showed us with the energy harvesting device and if the oxide was like um, oxide generated over and over. I think the energy harvesting um, uh, performance also had to like um, degrade, right? Mm -hmm. So is there any like um, changes in those kind of properties? Yep. Yeah, really good question. So, you know, basically if you have a wire, which I'm showing here with my pen and you start stretching it, you increase the surface area and when you do that, you're, this is your oxide, the oxide is going to uh, crack like that. And um, that will 100% for sure happen the first time you stretch it because um, the oxide is not that stretchable. It breaks at a, a few percent strain. And when, you, when it breaks, that exposes the underlying metal. And so then that's going to oxidize because it happens very, very quickly and oxygen's everywhere. But that oxide that forms is very, very thin. It's only a few nanometers thick. So what we have done, um, and it's not doesn't completely answer your question, but it gets to the heart of it um, or gets to the spirit of it. Uh, we've made wires. Uh, I don't remember the dimensions, but let's just say hundreds of microns in diameter. So they're fairly big. And then we stretch them and we measure the resistance. So we keep stretching and stretching and stretching. We do it many, many times. And the thought is if it if the oxide break keeps breaking and breaking, eventually you're going to consume or oxidize all of your gallium, and the resistance should go up. Uh, but in those experiments that we've done, and we've not published this, but we we don't see much change in resistance. Um, and so then the question is why? Well, one possibility is that the oxide is just so thin that you'd have to form lots and lots of oxide before you really see a difference in a wire that's 100 microns in size, right? 100 microns versus three nanometers is, you know, the, the oxide doesn't matter so much. So that's one possibility. Another possibility, as you said, is, uh, or you alluded to, is that if this is your oxide and this is a piece of paper and it's not stretchable. But if I kind of wrinkle it like that, I can stretch it without actually breaking it. And so the thought is, well, maybe when you stretch it the first time, you make higher surface area oxide. And then when you release it, it would just wrinkle. And I personally, I think that there's probably a little bit of both because when you look at it with your eyes, you can see that the surface is no longer shiny, which means there's some oxide there. But when you measure the resistance, you don't see much change. And so maybe there's a study out there on this, but I haven't seen it, but it'd be really interesting to actually measure that. Look at the cross section and see how the oxide gets thicker or, or maybe it doesn't. My gut feeling is it does not. Um, well, it does get thicker, but it doesn't get thicker indefinitely. It somehow gets to some some value and then slows down significantly. Um, and the electrical double air harvester, uh, that's something I'm a little uncomfortable with because we haven't studied it. Um, but uh, we did, I don't know, 100 cycles or something that was really not enough, but it was a starting point. Um, the droplets remain shiny. And I don't know if that's because they're in this hydrogel environment um, where maybe you could play some games with chemistry and pH or something like that. But um, 
I think the reality is if you if you use that device long enough, it's going to oxidize. Like there's there's no way around it. Uh, but over the short term, during our characterization, we didn't see that being in such an issue. So, yeah. Actually, Michael, if I can chime in there, I, I agree that the structure of the outside and the behavior is extremely complex. And actually, in my group, we have we have I had tried to look at that question. So we made a big blob of metal, and then we drilled a hole and spotted out all the liquid to see how much you can cover it, so that we mm -hmm. can see the cracking. Surprise, surprise! We drained almost all the liquid metal, and you can bend it almost to a very sharp angle, and the oxide doesn't break. So although we want to believe that uh, that uh, the oxide is uh, almost like a bulk oxide that is brittle, it's not. It's very pliable. At that level, the plasticity of the oxide is out of the roof. Like I, I, I wanted to see the cracks form, and I was shocked. And so mm -hmm. what we ended up doing is now we used a thermal expansion. We would grow the oxide thermally, and then we would let the bulk oxide, when it's it's like hundreds of microns, that's when you start the cracks and the, the fractals would start showing up. But when you have the native oxide, we tried, we failed beautifully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very expensive experiment, but gave us nothing. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, because we were using you that? SCM with a, with, a, with a fib on it. And then we were just really brastering the liquid from a, a single hole, from a really big, like hundreds of micron blob of metal to see when it collapses, what's going to happen. Huh. So we ended up making like a very nice uh, uh, baseball glove, but not scientifically publishable. <laughs> Interesting. All right. Uh, anybody else can jump in. Uh, Minsik, are you done with your questions? Or you have oh, more? yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Deacon. Thank you very uh, much, Dr. For sharing your um, super interesting results, also. Thank you. Thanks so for being the, here. The, the, the other people can jump in. Maybe we we go with the uh, professor Al, Willa. Oh. I think you're still muted. I'm sorry. Way. Okay, I open the sound. There yeah. we go. The discussion is very interesting. Uh, actually, it's related related with some important. Uh, problem of lip metals. So in the the interface uh, uh, section, you mentioned uh, the contact angle is not a uh, uh, useful or not a uh, 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 common uh, uh, mm -hmm. to uh, measure the uh, the vitability of lip metals because it's it's a true um, due to the uh, due to the presence of the uh, oxidized layer. So that makes the interface between the liquid metal and the ear is not a simple two-phase the liquid gas interface, but it's a, a it's a liquid solid and the ear three-phase interface. So since the contact angle is not a, a I mean it's not a good uh, measurement parameter. So I'm wondering, uh, what do you think about? Um, is there any better measurement uh, parameter for the uh, interface problem? <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, great question. Uh, metals. Yeah, so, well, and just to clarify a little bit, so I think the what I'm suggesting is that static contact angle is not useful. So I, I happen to have my, my cell phone sitting right here, right? So if I, the cell phone is solid, you know, and if I put it here and I said, well, what's the contact angle of this phone on my hand, right? That doesn't make it, that's not even a good question, right? Because I could actually hold it like this, or I could hold it like this. It's mechanical. It's a solid. I can make it anything I want. So all of those types of interfacial measurements rely on liquids um, adopting a shape that minimizes surface energy effectively. Um, and so what... What we did is we did advancing angles because that way we know we know the state of the oxide. We know that we there's no mechanical hysteresis. It's in a state of high tension. Um, uh -huh. There's been some other really nice work where people have um, like used um, vibrations to to break the oxide and and allow the oxide to kind of relax. And then 
you know, and then try to try to tease apart what's happening there. Um, personally, I think it's quite complicated because you have um, two things. Well, actually three things. You've got, uh, start with your liquid and then the oxide that forms on there. The oxide has mechanical properties. And at this point, um, our group and several other groups have measured the mechanical properties of that oxide. But just knowing the mechanical properties, even that by itself is not always enough because, I mean, look at this piece of paper, right? If I hold it really tight, it's, it's actually, I can sustain quite a bit of force. But if it's not tight, it could actually be uh, quite different if it's wrinkled or not smooth or if it's not in tension. So, so just simply saying the oxide's there is, is another complication. And then, and then not only that, I'll finish and then I'm, I want to hear what you have to say. But in addition to that, you've, with the oxide, you've now created two interfaces, the, um, the oxide air interface and then the oxide metal interface. So I personally, um, I don't know a very good answer to that other than the key thing, I think, if you're going to study this is to know this, at, at minimum, you need to know the state of the oxide. Is it under tension or is it not? Um, okay, you had you were going to add something else, and please correct me if I said something wrong. Uh, uh yes, uh, I think uh, it's a good answer actually. Uh, uh actually, I'm also uh, curious about the part two work. So, um, the uh, Doctor Kong um just mentioned uh several problems. I'm also uh wondering during the print the printing process is there. Uh, because when you add the copper particles into the liquid metal, uh, the mixture, uh, the uh, with viscosity of the mixture will increase. So when the mixture goes through the nozzle, uh, during the uh, due to the existence, uh, due to the uh, resistance, is there any uh, separation between the copper particles and the liquid metal, the substrate? Wow. The process, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Great. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> you, guys, you guys are really on, on point today. Yeah, another great question. So that work, there's a little bit of history there in our group, um, and I think even other groups. So if you just simply try to push particles, like let's say copper particles mm -hmm. in water, and you try to push them through a nozzle, the particles are going to, they're going to jam together. Yeah. So I imagine it's like trying to Without push the resistance, they will connect to each other. But when they met a uh, huge resist resistance, when the uh, flow maybe, uh, I think the the force will break the connection when the uh, the particle each other. Hmm. Yeah, they, they yeah they they might. Um. So there's yeah. So so first of all, um, we. We tried to print in the past, we tried to print copper particles inside of liquid metal. So liquid metal was continuous phase and then the little copper particles were inside of it. And that did not work very well because the particles would either stick, the copper particles would stick together or they would settle due to gravity. Um, the key advance here is that the material is like, a now it's like a gel, it's actually the, the particles are held together by the liquid metal particles. And so it's, it really is like, like I said, a sandcastle where the, it's got some paste like or gel like properties. Now, what happens when you push it through the nozzle? I don't know exactly. Um, but um, it's, it is interesting because in the gel state, when we've got water surrounding it, the conductivity is good, but it's not great. So it, it is conductive, but it's not very conductive. And I and then after you print it and it dries, the drying actually causes it to shrink and the particles get very close together and we get um, good electrical conductivity. So during the drying process, I don't remember the exact numbers off the top of my head, but it's something like 10 to the fourth or something improvement in conductivity. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question, but it's it's actually there's a bunch of like nuances to it. Um, understanding the reality, um, yeah. The the reality is actually it's it's amazing. You add should be to, a balance between the energy, the the flow rate, and the particle, and the yeah the parameter of the mixture. 
Yes. And it, to be honest, if we used a nozzle that was too small, we would see jamming, right? Because the particles we're using are like, I don't remember, 50 microns or something. Um, so that still could be a problem. And the other little trick, which I think was in my slide, but I don't think I said it, is we add a little bit of polymer. And that helps also with the printing, with the rheology. Um, but if you look at the rheology, um, what's, what's interesting um, is that if you only add a little bit of liquid metal, it's like 8%, that will give you a yield stress. And you need a yield stress because when you, basically you want it, when you push it out of the nozzle, you want it to flow, so yield. And then once it's out of the nozzle, you want it to hold its shape. And we only need to add 8% liquid metal to get that property. And so the, the, the idea is that the liquid metal is like going between all the copper particles. Um, the only thing we haven't looked at it as it comes out the nozzle, but once it's out of the nozzle, you can see that the, the liquid metal particles, they go from being round to like elongated. And, um, and so I do know that they're experiencing quite a bit of shear and that it will hold that shape. Okay. Did I answer you. your question? I don't know. I mean, there is, there's yeah, so many aspects to it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for being here, by the way. I appreciate it. Welcome, Mike. All right. Okay. Um, Xiang or Zingyu, uh, anyone can go. Oh, go ahead. Zingyu. Hi. Uh, great, great, great talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, Thank you. Uh, particularly the part about the bouncing of the liquid mm -hmm. metal of rough versus uh, smooth surfaces. So, um, yeah, we also observed a little bit that the smooth surfaces, the liquid metal tends seems to stick very, very strongly. Uh, we first noticed that because the some of the students in our lab were doing the liquid metal work, some of them weren't. And the ones that were doing it made the lab very dirty, meaning <laughs> the all the panels on their shelves and everything, they had liquid metal, which I think are oxides on them. And those are the surfaces that are relatively smooth. So, um, but but we try to, um, so we, we thought, well, this will be very easy to clean off, right? Because liquid, the metal oxide would be etched away by either acid or base, but it's not easy to clean off. Is that paradoxical? I mean, how how do you explain that? The, the fact that they can easily be etched in the solution, but when they are on the surface, they don't they don't come off easily. Do you have a good explanation for that? <laughs> uh, probably not a good one. Um, so if, if, first of all, I can completely empathize with what you're talking about, uh, the observations in your lab. Yeah. Um, I, we've done a lot better in our lab, but we've had periods where it was it, it was getting to be a problem. And just for, for people listening, um, if you haven't worked with these materials, because they do adhere to surfaces, I would think of it like wet paint, right? Like if you have a surface that has wet paint and you touch it with your finger, now there's going to be paint here and there's going to be paint on your finger. And then if you take your finger and you touch another surface like that, now there's going to be paint on that surface too. So you have to be a little bit careful when you're handling these materials. Make sure you use clean gloves and that kind of thing to, to not let it spread. Um, why is it difficult to clean? Actually, we got, uh, I'll just say this for, for, you, for you all in the community. We got a really nice suggestion from Carmel Majidi a few years ago because we were using like hydrochloric acid to clean it. And I was like, I don't really want hydrochloric acid to be well, in the lab, really, period, but especially don't want it on equipment. I don't want it on the walls. Um, and so they they actually use Simple Green. It's a, I don't know if it's a product in China, but it's um, it's like a, a spray um, that you can use. And so we have a lot of Simple Green sprays in our lab, and that seems to do a pretty good job of cleaning it. Um, I have no idea. Maybe Martin might have, have some better ideas, but I, I don't understand why you're observing it to be so difficult to clean with acid, unless it's, um, 
I mean, it, unless it's reacting with the surfaces or if it's getting down into the nooks and crannies of the surface, I don't know. Okay, yeah. try some more green answers. Uh, but I guess the further question is, uh, why do you observe the huge difference between the bouncing off on rough versus flat surfaces? So yeah. what is the reason behind that? Well, what we think is that the, the rough surface is like sort of similar to what people call Cassie Baxter state of wetting of liquids on surfaces where basically you've got some rough surface and when you bring the, uh, when you bring the oxide down like this, you know, if your surface is rough, you're not going to make as much contact area with the substrate. So our group and a few other groups have shown this, but I mean, Rebecca Kramer has a paper where they used uh, sputtered indium, which is, you know, it's pretty smooth, but it's got nanoscale roughness and it doesn't even stick to that. Um, it, it does not stick to that. Mm -mm. Oh, okay. No, I mean, she didn't do the bouncing experiments like we did. Okay. At least I don't think she did. But uh, but yeah, we've, we've used uh, small little particles We've done everything from kind of macro scale roughness down to, to nanoscale roughness. And anything that keeps the oxide from making good contact with the substrate, um, that helps. So it's it's not a perfect analogy, but I think of it a little bit like tape or something, right? Like tape is a film, and if the film cannot get down into the nooks and crannies, it's not going to work very well. Um, it's just tape has a thermo uh, has a viscoelastic coating on it and this is just okay. an oxide like you know martin was saying it's got this sort of solid light property um and so i think it's just it's just like not making much contact and so in that case you can um well i think this is worth mentioning so if you again mention think of this like the oxide and you bring this down onto a surface like this when you pull on the material, this is this is how you might want to remove a droplet, right? You you try to pull it off like this. And when you do that, it's got to break somewhere. And the question is, does it break at the interface like this, which is what you want if you want to clean the, your surface, or does it break somewhere in the middle? And so what you're doing with a rough surface is just basically lowering the force required to peel it off the surface. It's kind of like a peel force, if you want to think of it that way. So there would be like air trapped in the between the yep. rough surface. Okay. Yep. So in principle, if you do it in a say high vacuum, that would result in the same response between the rough and the smooth surfaces. Well, I think it wouldn't matter. I mean, the, the, okay, so there is there is air, and in like a high-speed camera, when you're dropping the, the drop, yeah. you've got to displace the air. So that's a complicating factor. Yeah. But even if you don't drop it, you bring it down at slower slower time scale, so the air could, in principle, have time to, to get out of there. The point okay. is that you you still have that surface roughness, and um, the key is that you're in that Cassie Baxter regime, is that you have little gaps where the oxide is touching nothing but either air or vacuum. So in either case, it, it would not stick. I, I don't think it would okay. stick, yeah. As okay. long as the oxide's there, yeah. For the sake of time, maybe we can have give uh, Xiang one, a short for one question. Because Thank you're you. very with the work. Because we're yeah. past 9.30 now. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Martin. Uh, thank you, Michael, uh, for an inspiring talk. Uh, inspiring talk. Uh, although I have been, <laughs> I have listened to, talk so many times, but every time I'm excited, every time I can learn something new. And uh, this, yeah, I, I, I think I'm just gonna ask the question about the uh, the um, the flattening of the liquid metal droplets uh, upon uh, the application of electrical candle oxidation, because I'm still fascinated about the phenomenon. In your review paper, you mentioned about like, for example, you apply a, um, a oxidative potential. Uh, what, uh, what, uh, what it does basically is you are forming an oxide layer. But meanwhile, the sodium hydroxide solution is removing the oxide layer. So we know that in air, even a thin oxide layer, like, like even two or three nanometers, is able to mechanically hold this structure. So it has to be conducted inside a solution, and it has to be a dynamic process. You're generating oxide layer, and you're removing oxide layer in the meantime. So I'm just wondering how thin 
the oxide layer should be to behave like the surfactant. <laughs> um, so it's not, not, not going to uh, mecha me mechanically support the structure. Um, but mm -hmm. meanwhile, killing its um, surface coherent force between atoms. Have you ever thought uh, or investigated how thin the oxide, oxide layer should be to, you know, to make us observe the, uh, the squashing or flattening um, uh, of liquid metal droplets? Yep. Yep. That's a great question. So, um, so the short answer is yes. And we have not quite published this yet, but we've done what's called impedance spectroscopy, which is basically you, you put the liquid metal into sodium hydroxide and you, um, you apply uh, frequencies, you sweep a frequency with a very small voltage, like 10 millivolts or something like that. And then you look at the response. And you look to see if it's acting like a capacitor or a resistor, or you know, basically you're looking at the, the relationship between voltage and current. And when we've done that, we've um, you can figure out the capacitance at the surface. And from the capacitance, you can estimate the thickness. And in that case, we actually find it's like molecularly thin. In other words, it's like a monolayer of oxide. Uh, which is crazy. I mean, but it but it makes sense because actually, if you look at the surface during these processes, it remains shiny. So we know that there's not a thick oxide there. Um, so so that's kind of interesting and surprising. The other thing that's that's interesting is, I think I should be able to share my screen here. But I pulled this data back up. But the other interest there's a few few interesting things now that we're taking a deeper dive. When we first published this paper. Uh, we thought that, you know, this is where there's no oxide and then suddenly the oxide forms. But now that we go back and do it very, very carefully, we find that the there's actually one little oxidation peak. Um, that So there's something that forms on the surface, but the tension actually doesn't drop initially. It's only when we start breaking down the oxide um, that it will start lowering the tension. So actually there might be a little bit of oxide here and then boom, it starts to drop. And the thing that is still a mystery to me, which I will put this out there for a community is like, why is it dropping? Because if it was simply a surfactant, which is what I said, yep. then you would say, oh, it's like here. And then you put the oxide and it should drop. And then yeah, that's it. It's just like by space. It shouldn't yeah. be a continuous drop. So it's just- Exactly. Yeah. And it's not, um, I want to clarify because it's, Actually, I don't think um, it's as simple as just saying the oxide is a surfactant. Um, it probably does lower the surface tension some, but I personally, this is my opinion, people might disagree, but I think that there's some stress that's in that oxide layer. And usually, you know, when we talk about surfaces, we talk about surface tension, right? Surface tension of water, surface tension of whatever. But I think that these electrochemical processes can generate compressive stresses compressive so okay. so that means the surface is trying to push itself outwards like that now why would it do that i mean there could be a number of reasons but if you imagine you have your oxide and you're like you're trying to like drive an ion through it well that creates a stress that pushes things outwards one possibility um, people have taken uh, cantilevers with, of coated with aluminum which is very similar to gallium and they apply a voltage to it and if the stress was tensile, it should bend. Oh, sorry, you can't mm -hmm. see my hand, but it should bend yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah. And if it's compressive, it should bend like that. Mm -hmm. And they actually, depending on the conditions, they can get compressive stresses in the during electrochemical oxidation. So I yeah, don't know. Actually, maybe not a very that's... satisfying answer, but it's essentially, as you're as you're oxidizing it, the surface is changing chemically, but it's also um, you could potentially be generating more and more stress. And um, I wish I had the data to show you, but it's pretty wild. It goes through this transition region and then it actually becomes linear. The stress becomes linear with voltage. So I've drawn it here to be linear, but you can see it's there's this transition where it's not linear. And then it, yeah. uh, it goes straight, straight down. <laughs> That's actually a very interesting insight. Because I never thought about that. The electrochemistry can actually produce some stress on the surface to push the drop rate outwards, I think. Uh, so it works in sodium hydroxide solution. How about in acid acidic solution? Because it is supposed to work in the same principle by removing the surface oxide layer. So yeah, yeah, 
Uh, yeah, it, it does work. Um, this original paper, we actually did like one experiment and one or two in acid, but we switched to sodium hydroxide because acid evaporates and then it gets into the air. And so we, we kind of moved away from acid and we should probably go back. But the point is it did spread. I just don't know, you know, the pH probably shifts the potential where a lot of these things happen. Um, and, you know, even that's interesting because you think, you know, you're applying an oxidative potential, so positive, right? But then the acid is also H plus. So how yeah. is it getting to the surface and dissolving the oxide? So it's complicated. Uh -huh. um, the reason we, you know, if you look at this, is I'm kind of embarrassed. We published this nine years ago, and we still don't understand it completely. And one of the reasons we don't understand it is whatever is on this surface, which again, we think it's very, very thin layer, very thin layer of oxide species, not even oxide, oxide species. Mm -hmm. um, whatever's on there, as soon as we turn the voltage off, it dissolves. So it's not so easy to, to take this and then look at the surface and figure out what's on there. It's not that we're being yeah. lazy. It's just a really difficult problem because you have ions, you have electrochemical reactions, you've got, uh, you know, surface effects, like sort of surfactant type effects. So yeah, I wish I had a more concise answer for you, but just to say it's it's complicated. And, and one last thing is it's just, we also see hysteresis. So here we're applying a more and more positive voltage, but then when we go back and I don't have the data in front of me, but we go back, it actually stays linear. So okay. these data points are truly a transition region. Okay, wow. Why yeah. you really publish those things? It's very interesting. I, I, think, I wish you published those things. <laughs> I think I think this is very exciting, but for the sake of time, if you allow me, I would uh, like to uh, request that we continue the conversation. Mm -hmm. Of course, we could not we could not ask for a better way to uh, kind of come to the end of this uh, liquid metal series because there is more questions to be answered. Uh, there's there's so much fascination, fascinating science that uh, we need to get into, and uh, uh, for the sake of time, please allow me to. Uh, continue to the uh, to the uh, um, next part of uh, of this, and uh, let us thank uh, our uh, speaker today for um, coming in. So, Michael, thank you very much for. If I can get my mouse to move, uh, for gracing this event. And uh, if we were in a live uh, uh, view uh, or like in a in a Brave session, we, Alice and I would have walked up to, up to the stage and given you this. So accept this uh, as our appreciation for uh, being our speaker for today. And we'll send this to you by uh, by email. Thank you. Uh, please join us next week uh, as we listen to Marcus Antonieri. And uh, it's going to be a, another fascinating uh, as look into uh, colloids. And with that, I want to say thank everyone and thank you so much for, for your time. So thank thanks. You.不再是奇迹，不再是幻想，此刻正感觉全世界离我孤单了。不必太在意身旁惊奇的目光，可以点点头，可以放声歌唱。我创造奇迹，我拥有梦想，我希望看见所有骄傲的脸庞。再为曾经失败放弃或感伤，努力才是真的方向。I can, I can， 没有什么可以阻挡心中无限的力量。I can, I can， 你也能够像我一样飞越最高山岗。I can, I can。我可以阻挡心中无限的力量。I can, I can， 你也能够像我一样飞越最高山岗。
我创造奇迹，我拥有梦想，我希望看见所有骄傲的脸庞。不再为曾经失败放弃或感伤，努力才是真的方向。I can, I can， 没有什么可以阻挡心中无限的。